Do you want to learn more about one of the most influential Jews that ever lived on this earth? And he lived here in Israel. That's right, you're here today on Insights Israel in the Middle East. We follow the incredible life of Paul the Apostle. Stay tuned. We're standing here at the Southern Steps, the place where we're introduced to the character of Paul the Apostle, one of the most fascinating and impactful characters of history. He starts out as the persecutor of the early church, who through a dramatic transformation and encounter with God, becomes the engine spreading the gospel from here in Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. But not only that, Paul does something incredible. He writes to those early churches, and still to this day, millions of people around the world can draw on his wisdom, his initial encounter and passion for building the church to understand how God operates in this world. Today, we're going deep into the story of Paul the Apostle, the man who almost more than anyone else in history shaped the world we live in. Who could have penned the words of 1 Corinthians 13? As a religious zealot? No, it's Paul. Pens these words on love that basically define love for the next 2,000 years. What would possess a man to do the things that he did, to try the things that he tried, to endure the things that he endured? Anyone else who said, well, you come to the town, you have a message, well, we beat you half to death. <laughs> We're not expecting you to come back. Right. And two years me. later, the yeah. same guy knocks on the door. He's yeah, like, yeah. excuse me, I'm not <laughs> done with my message. <laughs> and like, who two. is this guy? He acknowledges it was the power of God's grace that allowed him to go on. I met with Michael Kevin, who lectures on Paul the Apostle. His work with Derech Avraham, or Abraham's Path, has taken him throughout the Middle East, literally following in the footsteps of Paul. We met at the Caesarea port, built around 10 BC by Herod the Great. This major port city played a pivotal role in the spread of early Christianity, especially for Paul. So Mike, we're here talking about Paul the Apostle, Shaul Tarsi, as we say in Hebrew. For someone who's never heard this name before, who are we talking about? Uh, Shaul obviously was a, you know, a, a child of the diaspora in a way. I mean, his family was from Tarsus, which was a very prominent city in the Roman Empire. It still exists today, actually, in, in southeastern Turkey, and then comes to Jerusalem at quite an early age, probably about 13. But he came here to, you know, learn under the rabbis. He was respected in the council in Jerusalem. He's zealous, he's ambitious. Paul says, you know, I was advancing beyond many my own age. From the heart of Jerusalem's Jewish scholarly halls, an unexpected path waited for Paul. What came next? A radical transformation. So how, how does Shaul Saul transition to be the father of what we would call Christianity? <laughs> yeah, it's funny you should say that because at, at times, you know, we'll talk to Jewish people here in, in the land and they'll say to you, I don't have a problem with Yeshua, but I have a problem with Paul. You know, because he's the, he started the religion in a way, that's their thought. So when he leaves, uh, he gets letters. You know, it's obviously this zealous young rabbi. He's going, forget it. I'm not even staying in Jerusalem. I'm going to Damascus. I've got authority from the chief rabbi, letters from the chief rabbi to do important missions around the Middle East. So he goes on his way to Damascus, which is only, you know, about 40 kilometers to Damascus. He's hit by a light. So he's pushed off his horse, the light comes from heaven, and he is struck to the ground. He's basically saying, who, who are you, Lord? Who is this? And he says, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. And it's interesting because he's not really persecuting Jesus, he's persecuting the body, but Jesus has taken the body as personal. And he says, basically, you're persecuting me. He speaks about, in Galatians 1, the whole issue of, I received this gospel by revelation. I didn't really choose him, he chose me. On one side, it's kind of like, okay, I've been chosen by him, I'm in love with him, I understand who he is, but I'm also now being sent on a mission on this, you know, this journey. After his revelation, Paul set out on a clear mission to spread the word of Christ. Starting in Jerusalem, he journeyed to places like Antioch, Ephesus, Corinth, Philippi, and Thessalonica. However, his deep faith disturbed both Jewish and Roman leaders who perceived his teachings as a threat to traditional beliefs and the empire's stability. Paul endured beatings, was stoned, and was imprisoned multiple times for his convictions. After facing trials in Caesarea, he embarked on his final journey to the heart of the empire, Rome. That's right around 60 AD, and that's probably when he's gonna be executed by Nero as a, most likely, you know, if the Jews were a scapegoat, the Jewish sect of 
the Jesus the Nazarene was even more of a scapegoat. And uh, most likely he's then executed in Rome. Oh, he lives to about 60 years, about 30 years after the crucifixion of Yeshua. They're probably somewhat the same age. You highlight something that many people miss in the story of Paul. Because when you read the Bible from cover to cover, you oftentimes don't have an exact context of how long things take. Right. Paul has this very extended ministry time. I mean, he just, he obsessively moves from place to place. No, and, and an incredible danger. I mean, he, I mean, he's talking about multiple shipwrecks, night and day on the open sea. And he's going through famine, he says. He's, he's gone in without clothes at times. I mean, the things that he goes through physically in his own body in this whole region, it's, it's absolutely indescribable. But this whole idea is it's gotta work in the most difficult, dark situation in the entire earth is part of what's driving me. If the truth is the truth everywhere, and I'll pursue it no matter where it leads me. And that, that integrity, he does it from the innermost place to the outermost place of the earth, and that's what catches our attention. This is a Jewish story in a way. When he writes this book of Romans, he does say things that people, I don't think, even really understand or take notice of. I mean, he says in the Torah, we have the embodiment of knowledge and truth. I mean, wait a minute here. He's being accused of destroying the Torah. He's being accused of desecrating the holy places. He's got all these uh, accusations. And yet his honor and his view of the scriptures remains yeah. very, very high. He upholds the Torah. He acknowledges that it's truth, but it's limited in its ability to save. And he says it right here to King Agrippa. He says to these things have no value in restraining the flesh, in getting over our tendency to sin. It's only the Holy Spirit, it's only this new covenant written on our hearts that will obviously give us the power to overcome. So, I mean, to, to your point of why Paul was chosen, right? you know, at the time he, he probably looked at it and the people around him looked at it as like, this is an odd choice, <laughs> you know. No question. But, but if you no look question. at it today, right. so what are the character traits? What is a knowledge base? What are the oratory skills that right. are needed for someone to be able to traverse the world at that pace for that long? You know, one of the things about Paul that you have to say, especially in his early life, is that he was committed to following the truth wherever it led. Yeah. It's the obedience that comes from faith that is gonna be the mark of the New Covenant community. Welcome back. When we think about Paul, about Shaul, we're sitting here on this beautiful balcony, but just behind us is the southern steps to the temple. And we know, according to the Mishnah, that Gamliel had his school where Paul was studying, was on those stairs. There's no doubt that Shaul the man is a unique individual. And if you think about this question of like, what does it take for the gospel that was a localized Galilee then Jerusalem event to go global, it really takes something very unique. I mean, there, there, there isn't any other incident in history where something that starts so small, where someone, especially someone like Paul, is able to take that message and spread it across the world. God picks people like Paul, someone who's both an Orthodox Jew of the time, both scholarly and Jewish studies, but also this incredible philosopher who's able to come and engage with different societies, different people. He's writing as a Jewish person, traveling the Roman Empire to communities of mixed Jews and Gentiles, trying to explain to them how they can believe in a Jewish Messiah. In a Jewish Messiah and a Jewish religion. And the fact is that when there was a wave of Gentile embracing this faith, here in Jerusalem, there was a debate between, among the disciples. What do we do with those Gentiles who are starting to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and embracing Yeshua as their Messiah? Yeah, and I think that's God's nature. He works in counterintuitive ways. He finds people like Shaulat al Sid, Paul, who in a very creative and headstrong way brings this message to countries around the world where still today you can find believers in those same communities where he set foot. Mm -hmm. Let's continue watching how a man that God meets impact the whole world till today. Let's continue watching. So we've been sitting here talking about the life of Paul. Mm -hmm. Your life story in a very interesting way sort of connects to that through right. working with the churches in this part of the world. You've had the privilege that not many people in the world have of going back several thousand years later mm -hmm. to the same places in Eastern Turkey throughout that region where Paul, I mean, physically treks on right. foot and establishes what is the early church. As a secular Jew coming to faith, you know, I had kind of uh, 
unusual testimony. I actually got my call, sort of the Pauline kind of call, while I was in university studying, one of the best, best secular universities in the United States. And my, I think my professors thought, oh, it's a lost cause, you know, what do you know? They're the bad guys and you're gonna be off to be a missionary and who knows where. You know, I came to this part of the world, I was learning Turkish and using it really as a base to go into the Muslim world. And a lot of that Muslim world had to do with Turkish and Kurdish speakers in an area where Paul traveled. So I started to travel the same journey and like, oh, Paul was here, he was there. Oh, wait a minute, there was a Jewish community here, there was Jews here. Wait a minute, how did these come together? And you sort of got to walk it out in the context of mainly in a Muslim society where you had a lot of opposition to your faith. Yeah. So the issue of opposition and persecution and overcoming, those things were key in the message of Paul's life, what he embodied and everything like else. And I started to really get into the letters of Paul. I'm serving the Lord in a part of the world that is extremely against the gospel. There, I would end up in villages somewhere in the Muslim world and they, you know, they maybe just returned from the Hajj, they were ready to stone you when they found out you were from Israel. So as I started to you know, understand more of his life, his roots, seeing the places, going to the cities, I not only started to understand more about what made up the man, just through the physical topography of how he had to travel, but I also started to see something else. He embodied this call of the Jewish people. And that's what caught my attention. The restoration of the Jewish people is a key part of even the New Covenant story. Even yeah. in the Jeremiah 31, I'm gonna write the Torah on their hearts, but I'm also gonna restore this historic divide between Israel and Judah. Above all, what's frequently overlooked is that Paul's greatest aspiration was a united world, bringing Jews and Gentiles together in harmony. He was a man of deep love, did whatever he could to bring people together. And the best place we can see it is when he, when he kind of writes Romans. I wish myself accursed, cut off, if only the sake of my Jewish people could come in. He says, willing to give up his place, his relationship with God, if only his Jewish people. Theirs is the adoption, theirs is the scriptures, theirs is the promises, theirs is the fathers. He still is honoring God's yeah. choice of Jerusalem and his own people, even though they're his biggest antagonist. That, you know, that's incredible. I mean, here he suffered so much at their hands, and yet he retained this heart of forgiveness, this humility, this love, this integrity, literally the heart of Yeshua, even in the midst of all he went through. And that, yeah. that puts him in a class by himself. Shaul, Paulus. Today with us, we have Ron Counter. Ron Counter is one of the leaders of the Messianic movement here in Israel. He's an author of two books. Ron, what a great joy having you with us. A warm shalom Great and to be welcome. here. Thanks so much. When we talk about Paul, we talk about Shaul HaShaliach. When you think about Paul, what comes up in your mind? A lot of Jewish people, when they talk about Paul, they say he was anti-Semitic. They say that he created a new religion. He left Judaism. But we don't find that in the New Testament. In fact, in Acts, he says, I am present tense of Pharisee. In Romans 11, he says, I am, not I was, an Israelite. Uh, he reveals his heart for the Jewish people in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, it's probably one of the most devastating passages in the entire Bible. And it shows God's heart for Israel through this Jewish rabbi, Paul. Because what does he say? He says, I am telling the truth, mm -hmm. I, I'm not lying. Now, first of all, isn't it a little weird that Paul, the apostle, has to say, I'm not lying? Mm -hmm. well, well, Paul, we, we didn't think you would lie. In other words, he's about to say something so powerful that we might not believe it. Mm -hmm. And he says, I could wish myself accursed mm -hmm. and cut off from Messiah for the sake of my own people, the people of Israel. He was willing to die for Israel. When you think about the writings of Paul, what impacts you the most? It's the background to the book of Romans. A lot of people don't know why he wrote Romans. Mm -hmm. Yes, salvation by faith, justification by faith. You know, Martin Luther had this great revelation from Rome. Absolutely, that's in there. Mm -hmm. But that's not why he wrote it. Mm -hmm. The reason he wrote it was because in 49, the year 49, Claudius kicked all the Jews out of Rome. Mm -hmm. And according to Suetonius, a historian, it was over somebody by the name of Crestus, which nobody knows who mm -hmm. that is, but it sounds a lot like Christos or Christ or Messiah. Mm -hmm. the, the scholarly uh, hypothesis is that the Messianic Jews and the non-Messianic Jews were fighting and Claudius just, he kicks the Jews out and 
Five years later, a guy by the name of Nero becomes the emperor of Rome. Mm -hmm. He lets the Jews mm -hmm. come back in. And if you read the book of Romans, the Jews who, Jewish believers rather, who came back into the mm -hmm. Kehillah, into the church, they were not received. During the five years that they were gone, it seems that the believers there, now completely Gentile and without a Bible, mm -hmm. because the Jews took the only, there, there was no New Testament. There was no Romans because Paul is about to write yes. Romans. Paul writes Romans and he says, has God rejected Israel? Mm. By no means. I myself am an Israelite. He says salvation has come to the nations because of Israel's rejection, but now you're called mm. to make Beautiful. Israel jealous. So Romans was written because the Roman church became the first group of believers to become anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. to turn against Israel. If we look at the end of the book of Acts, he calls for the Jewish leaders in Rome and he wants to win them. And he says, these change, because now he's kind of a home uh, on house arrest. You know, they didn't have, uh, what, what do they call the, <laughs> the collars for his, for his uh, uh, foot, but he was, he was in change and he says, it's for the hope of Israel, Yeshua the Messiah, that I'm in this change. So to the very end, even though he was the apostle to the nations, he had such a heart to win Jewish people. So, you know, I just hope that our viewers understand Paul's heart because Paul's heart was God's heart for Israel. Beautiful. And the great end times revival, it's gonna start here in Jerusalem. Amen. Ron, as you know, people are watching us from all over the world, people who love Israel, who love the Jewish people, just like a closing thought. And maybe if you have a message that you want to pass to the world. Right. Well, you know, Paul said it's for the hope of Israel that he's in chains. And then in Romans 11, he says that Israel's rejection. Do you understand that God has imposed mm. hardness of heart on our people for 2,000 years? So only a few of us actually have come to faith. Shmuel, like myself, a few, uh, 10, 20,000 here in Israel out of over 6 million. There's a hardness of heart that God, and I think it's broken God's heart, but that has enabled the nations to come into the kingdom. And he says that Israel's rejection caused riches for you in America or Russia or Italy or wherever you are. Israel's rejection caused riches for you. Paul says greater riches are gonna come Amen. when the Jewish people accept the gospel. I just wanna ask you, enter into Paul's heart. Go back and read Romans 9 where he says, I would be willing to perish, to go to hell, if only the Jewish people would believe. Read that and then go into intercession for the Jewish people. Pray for revival here in Israel. Thank you. Thank you. Ron, what a great honor. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. And to you, our friends, like Ron told us, pray. Be a watchman on the wall. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. I'm on my way to the heart of Jerusalem a city spanning just 48 square miles, though within its walls, over half a million Jews and nearly a third of a million Arabs live side by side. It's a city where everyday interactions mirror deep-rooted histories and where tension often simmers just beneath the surface. That place is beautiful, David. Oh, thank you. I'm meeting David Pelegi, the director and pastor of Christ Church, a church and congregation that defies the tensions of this city and embodies Paul's vision of unity in a divided world. This is the oldest Protestant church in the Middle East, and it's been here in one form or another for 200 years. What is Christ Church in Jaffa Gate? Like, how would you define this place? Well, if I could use uh, one word, I would say it's unique. Mm -hmm. It's a church that was built largely, although not exclusively, for Jewish believers in Jesus. We have an extensive work among the poor of Jerusalem. We can love Jews and love Arabs. We don't have to take sides, because certainly Jerusalem, a very divided city with a lot of misunderstanding, needs something like this. Just like in the divided city of Jerusalem today, Paul envisioned creating unity, which he called one new man. The heart of what Paul is saying is really very simple. At one time, Gentiles were quite hostile. You were lost, you were cut off from the God of Israel. You had no hope in the world. And yet, thanks to the life, death, and resurrection of the Jewish Messiah, 
Now the Gentiles can come in and share in Israel's riches and yet do not need to convert. The animosity between these two groups is put to an end thanks to the cross. And then Paul goes on to talk about this being one new man, right? One new creation. The imagery comes out of marriage, but what happens when two become one flesh? They still remain two. And you have unity, and yet you have diversity. And it is hard work. How am I going to live and serve and love uh, others who may have some really difficult doctrines for me. The author of Acts tells us, and they were united. That understanding doesn't just come from the New Testament, it comes from the Old Testament. Well, I, I love the Hebrew well. version of that. It says, they were in one heart, one spirit. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very powerful phrase to exactly. aspire to. You're in this high friction, high conflict area. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you apply this, you know, highbrow theology and philosophy and uh, moral code into everyday life in the old city in Jerusalem? Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. If there are people on the ground in a congregation and they're living in the midst of tension, like the tension in Jerusalem, and they're going out of their way to serve other Christians, especially those Christians they may not agree with, and that is what serves as a model for the rest of the community. David and Christ Church inspire us all, and no doubt bring pride and honor to the memory, teachings, and vision of Paul. We can be distinct, but at the same time live in what is best described as biblical unity. Everyone doesn't have to be like us, and that's whether you're in politics or on social media or in a church. Yes, the human anxiety is, I don't want people to be different. I want them really to be like me, or at least to think like me. That's not biblical unity. What we find in the book of Ephesians is the unity of the Spirit. And that unity of the Spirit is maintained by the way the members of any community treat each other. So I hope that uh, what happens here might inspire other people uh, around the world. Hello, this is Mati here in Jerusalem with TBN Israel. This is Yair Pinto from TBN Israel here in Jerusalem. TBN Israel is keeping viewers informed with Israel-focused news, culture, and what God is doing in this land. Support TBN Israel today online at tbn.org Israel. Thank you.